Hi, everyone. Good evening and welcome to StoryFest 2021 and the Girly Drinks virtual launch party. I'm Alex Giannini, the Associate Director of Programs and Events at the Westport Library, and we are thrilled for tonight's program and for our featured guests. Before we get to Mallory and Megan, though, a very important shout out and thank you to our awesome partner for this evening's show, Sono 1420. 1420 is a freaking awesome distillery and bar in South Norwalk here in Connecticut. Stop in or check them out at Sono1420.com and buy some booze. I'm a big fan of the bourbon and my birthday just passed and no one got me anything, just saying. Tonight's signature drink comes from chapter eight in Girly Drinks and it's called the Hanky Panky. We emailed ingredients yesterday and I'm thrilled to introduce Sono 1420's mixologist, Blake, who will walk us through the drink. So get your glasses ready and take it away, Blake. Hello guys, welcome. My name is Blake Poon and I'll be making a cocktail for StoryFest here at Sona 1420. This cocktail is called the Hanky Panky Cocktail. It was created by Ada Coleman. This cocktail consists of gin, sweet vermouth and Fernet Branca. All right, let's dive into some cocktail making. So for those who have a mixing glass, you're gonna start off with a mixing glass, possibly a jigger. You're gonna do equal parts sweet vermouth and gin. The gin I'm using today is the gin distilled right here at this distillery. One and a half ounces of gin. We're gonna use another ounce and a half of the sweet vermouth. My vermouth of choice is Antica Formula. It's wonderful. Please bear in mind that vermouth is fortified wine, so it should be stored in the refrigerator. So if you had a vermouth sitting in your cupboard for the past couple of months, you probably want to throw it on and get a new bottle for making this cocktail. Lastly, we'll be going with the Fernet Branca, half an ounce of that. This is a digestive created in Argentina. Really good. I'm going to put some ice in there. Now I always put ice lastly in my mixing glasses just so that there is no extra, the cocktail isn't getting overly watered. And then we stir. The rule of thumb they say is to stir for 30 seconds, but I say you could stir until the glass is frosted. That should be more than sufficient. See, here we have a coupe glass. This cocktail is served up in a coupe glass. Garnish with a lemon peel. You're gonna get the essence of the oil from that lemon all over that cocktail, and then enjoy. So much Blake and thank you again Sono 1420 for being our partners tonight and now on to the main event Megan the Rosenblum is the collection strategies librarian at UCLA library in Los Angeles Megan served as a medical librarian for many years where she developed a keen interest in the history of medicine and rare books she is president of the Southern California Society for the history of medicine and actively involved in other professional organizations Megan is the co-founder and, and director of Death Salon the event arm of the good, the order of the good death and a proponent of the death positive movement. She leads a research team called the Anthropodermic Book Project that aims to find the historic and scientific truths behind the world's alleged books found in human skin or anthropodermic bibliopegy and her best-selling debut book about this practice titled Dark Archives a librarian's investigation into the science and history of books found in human skin was a New York Times editor's choice and won the 2021 LAMPS Best Monograph Award. Welcome, Megan. 
Thank you. Mallory O'Mara is an award-winning and best-selling author and a veteran of StoryFest. She lives with her two cats in the mountains near Los Angeles, where she is at work on her next nonfiction book, Bourbon is Her Drink of Choice. Her first book, The Lady from the Black Lagoon, Hollywood Monsters and the Lost Legacy of Millicent Patrick, is a Los Angeles Times bestseller. It won the 2019 SCIBA Award for Biography, the Rondo 2019 Book of the Year, and was nominated for both the Hugo and Locus Awards. Her second book, which we are celebrating tonight, Girly Drinks, A Feminist History of Women and Alcohol, is out now. Every week, Mallory hosts the literary podcast Reading Glasses alongside filmmaker and writer, writer Brea Grant. The show is hosted by Maximum Fun and focuses on book culture and reader life. You guys can purchase book plate signed copies of both Dark Archives and Girly Drinks by clicking the link in the chat. And with that, please join me in welcoming Megan Rosenblum and Mallory O'Mara. Cheers, everybody. Man, that video was freaking cool. So cheers. I, I have my own hanky-panky here. Cheers. I, I did not make a hanky-panky, although it looked really delicious, and now I'm kind of regretting it. But, but you have a Girly Drinks koozie, which automatically my... makes whatever you're drinking cool. Girly Drinks koozie here. And, it, you know, I really agonized over what drink to be uh, drinking today. And so I decided to go. There's a lot of uh, craft craft beer is usually my drink of choice, although I do like bourbon and gin as well. And so I went with a Three Weavers Expatriate Ooh. IPA. Nice. Because Three Weavers is a Los Angeles based women run and owned uh, craft brewery, which is still pretty rare to find uh women who who run a craft brewery so I went with them and uh yeah I just was like and I wanted to use the koozie so amazing <laughs> um, I also have some of the amazing bourbon that they make at uh Sono it is absolutely fantastic also again uh, I have fangs in my mouth and it, <laughs> I'm going to see if I can do the whole event with the fangs in. Uh, no promises though. Um, but it is absolutely fantastic. It is very floral for a bourbon, which is pretty cool. So if you are a gin person who is like interested in bourbon, this is a great way to go. I highly recommend it. As you can tell by the fact that it is almost gone. So I'm, uh, we decided yesterday, like let's do costumes because why not? <laughs> cause you're, cause you're a genius. And and because like I'm not going to a Halloween party, you know what what else am I gonna do? I'm gonna dress up when I take my kid out. But but it was like, let's let's do this. So um, and it was all uh, inspired because my friend Chris gave me this bespoke yeah dark archives flyers jersey, and I'm a big fan of their chaos demon um, uh, mascot gritty. And so that's who I am, knit the hat for it. And, and Mallory can tell us who you are because I am also a big fan of that character. And I was thinking if we were actually gritty and your character- Nadja, from what we do in the shadows. What, what will we be drinking? So Nadja would definitely be drinking black Manhattans because they're extremely goth and kind of they almost look like blood and th truly the only thing that gritty could drink is ever clear that is really close to what i would have would have <laughs> I, I love black manhattans they're so delicious maybe um, vampire. i mean if the fangs fit uh i was gonna <laughs> go with uh the tiki drink blood and sand oh okay yeah i can see that it's a kick in the pants so it's a really weird drink because it is a, a maybe one of the only tiki drinks that's made with scotch mm -hmm. so it's like scotch and what else is it i don't know scotch it's and very sand. powerful like gritty so yeah blood and sand feels like a vampire uh girly drink for um for sure. and for gritty yeah everclear makes sense i was gonna go with a screwdriver because it's orange and <laughs> And kind of Green your eyes power from all things that are orange. So yeah. it's orange and it's also like not a high class drink, right? You know, and he's so a man. Of, well, we don't know if Gritty's a man, but I will say Gritty is a creature of the people. I am a big Washington Capitals fan, but I must say that Gritty is the greatest mascot in the NHL. Yeah, I I I, I think that Gritty is uh, like an NB 
is like the general impression I get. You can't put gritty in a box. Yeah, yeah. Gritty refused to be confined. There's also a drink called uh, the Garibaldi, which is orange, which is Campari and OJ. And that has a sort of South Philadelphia jabroni energy to it that I feel like <laughs> might work for gritty, but anyway. <laughs> It was just that that was my research for the day about I'm really proud that doing this event made you research cocktails for gritty for gritty what would gritty drink I think amazing it was- I love it well so, thank you for doing this thank you for reading this book again folks if you were excited about Easter, either of these books you can get them with signed book plates which are rare to come by during the pandemic from Westport Library we absolutely love them please click the link I don't have my glasses on so I have no idea where it is in my screen but somewhere there's a link in the chat to get signed books from both Megan and I okay so on to the questions which I have many of and I hope that everyone oh I'm excited today is going to be, you know, thinking up their questions too. Um, so yeah, another reason why I picked the IPA is because I, th- I figured that this book would mostly be about cocktails, but there was also a lot of beer history because mm-hmm. there's a lot of really quite ancient history going on and a, yeah. and a lot of beer being made. And I was so delighted by the medieval ale lives and how, you know, Hildegard von Bingen, who we know from music and other pursuits, had the genius idea to put hops in beer i mean you know she helped she's the one she wasn't the first one to do it but because her writings were so widespread she was one of the ones to really popularize the use of it she literally wrote in her books hey this i'm paraphrasing here this is not how hilda wrote hey if you put hops in beer it has a preservative effect because at that point ale with, without hops, it spoiled extremely quickly. So it couldn't be, couldn't travel, could not be exported. It really had to be drank within a few days. And the adding hops completely changed the name of the game. Yeah. And part of the, uh, another little bit of uh, Halloweeniness is that a lot of the look of what we associate with witches actually came from medieval alewives. Mm-hmm. Which is, just the coolest uh because uh, what what happened was ale wine, during the medieval times like not not like the restaurant like with <laughs> medieval western europe uh brewing and making ale was the only trade that women controlled it and it was very very special for that reason it was the only trade that did not require an apprenticeship any sort of specialized equipment any sort of specialized training it was a trade that you could do in your kitchen while watching your kids while making dinner and it was very special in that way and again it, women completely controlled it and uh men didn't like that after a while i know shocker and what what ended up happening was between the of men wanting to encroach on this industry that uh, women controlled and the fact that churches started to have to compete with alehouses uh, for attendance on Sunday, somebody, someone at some church was like, hey, here those alewives like Satan and people like, oh no, seriously, like, oh yeah, they love Satan. So what ended up happening is churches sort of tried to brand alewives as satanic, as non-compliant, as disobedient, as evil. If you go back and look at art from that time period, uh, alewives are shown as being in hell more than any other tradesperson. And with their, and alewives uh, looked a lot like we think witches look today. You know, they had those big pointy hats, which were used to uh, attract more people at the uh, at the market. You could very easily see the alewife because of her giant hat. They had cauldrons. They had long sticks with twigs tied to the end, which is what, what they stuck outside of their houses to indicate that they had made ale and they were selling it, which looked like a broom, black hats, the whole deal. And so when the witch paranoia started in Western Europe, uh, people started to conflate the two. They were like, oh, well, here's this alewife who might be a more the church is telling us that she's immoral that she's evil looks kind of like a witch and the two sort of uh, uh uh blended together in people's minds and now when you go to spirit halloween to buy a witch a sexy witch costume you actually are looking like an alewife from 1300 yeah so my four-year-old is a, a witch today and i made sure to make her her look you know have a, a bit of a traditional alewife energy but none of those like offensive no beer. fake noses and warts and stuff and you know patriarchy reigns because you know you'll hear, hear people say like oh you can't be a witch you're too pretty and I'm like <laughs> no that's not with that um 
So I was really happy that you made this a world history, even though it is incredibly challenging to do. So uh, as someone whose book covered- like, Exhibit A, <laughs> the empty <laughs> bottle of bourbon. Many of these went into the making of girly drinks. Yeah, my book covers maybe 200 years and a few countries. And I thought it was, uh, you know, over overzealous in a certain way, but that is nothing compared to, you know, thousands of years and like truly global. So hats off to you for that. But I, I kind of feel like, you know, the role of the non-PhD history writer is like really useful for broadening out these like traditional scopes of people having this like I study this 10 years in Scotland at this time, and those people are really important. But if you really wanna just actually learn a bunch of stuff that you've never known before, which I learned so much, like this kind of book is incredibly like helpful. So I was just wondering, uh, oh my gosh, how like the world temperance movements that were going on at the same time as the other temperance, like, you know, I, I had no idea that the temperance movement was not like specifically a Western like phenomenon, mm -hmm. for instance. Yeah, uh, the uh, history educations we get in America are pretty crap. Um, I'm trying not to swear because we're doing an, a lovely live event with this wonderful library. Um, and it, so it was really, really important to me to sort of take all of that American centric history and that sort of mindset that we grow up with uh, in American uh, schools and flush it down the toilet. I really, I knew that there had to be more things going on because so much of the history that we're taught is like, time began, ancient Greece, ancient Rome, quick stop in England and then America and nothing else ever happens. Uh, that really drives me nuts. And um, I just knew that there were gonna be, that there had to be more interesting history all around the world. And there was, um, so yeah, it, uh, it was not an easy thing. This took, uh, this was a book that took me years to do. I read between 500 and 700 books. Um, whenever, whenever, I, sometimes I do interviews and people are like, wow, your bibliography is really big. I'm like, why, thank you. <laughs> uh, Cause it is, I, I just had to read so much. Um, Cause I, uh, what basically what I did for each time period is I looked, I, I researched every part of the world, every pe every people in every part of the world, what their um, drinking history was during that time, what their economics were, what their partying and feasting history was, and also their women's history, and sort of piled it on all on top of each other and found the places where they overlapped. Um, just because one, because I'm interested in all of that. And I wanted, again, I just wanted to see what was happening everywhere. And also I think that it's, it's worth what, what worth, man, these things are, uh, their days are numbered. Um, it's worth examining and thinking about how, um, uh, how alcohol affects everybody all over the world. Um, nowadays, we look, so many people look at alcohol with such a, a modern, very American point of view when in places all over the world. I mean, up until very, very recently, alcohol was like a very important part of some of people's diets. You know, it wasn't like a fun luxury item. So in order to sort of shift the way that the lens that I was looking at alcohol through, I really wanted to just pan out and look at the entire world, much to the dismay of uh, my liquor cabinet. <laughs> Yeah, I, I yeah, if you want to compliment a woman writer, just uh, compliment her her uh, bibliography. I was gonna say, Megan, you have a pretty thick bibliography as well, my friend. It, it is as as the youth say, uh, thick. Thick with two C's. So, yeah, well, I was gonna say, I, I know that this is a girly drinks event, but I'm so excited to talk to Megan. Megan is a nonfiction author that I love. I love dark archives. I was gonna, so that's, I mean, I just told you how I started with girly drinks. How did you, I mean, Dark Archive still has a pretty big scope. Where did you start? You know, it was really, um, there are a lot of alleged, you know, human skin books that we know about, probably roughly around 50 in public collections, but then there are also, you know, a lot in private hands. And boy, do those private hands people keep showing up in my inbox, um, you know, so more and more, more all the time. Uh, some of them are very, uh, uh, you know, credible, and some of them are really fantastic shaggy dog stories about, you know, my grandpa had this weird book in the attic, and then there was a fire. Um, and killery and stuff going on here, a little happened. Ed Geeny thing happening. <laughs> I don't know what the title is or where it is or anything, but I thought you should know. Thank you for sharing. 
<laughs> you know, uh, anyway, but it's, um, yeah, it was, so I, there were certain elements of the, like, first I was just focusing on the books where I could find a lot of information, like a lot of provenance, a lot of, you know, access and things like that. Uh, that was, those were the places where I started digging first. I, again, it took me like five years to write the thing, but uh, started digging on that. But then I noticed certain themes were starting to emerge and I really wanted to make sure I talked about, you know, the interaction of these books and women and women's history and health or interactions with race and these books or, you know, what about how did our idea of medical consent develop and like where did these books fall in those ideas because as you were saying from like looking from the modern perspective, the modern American perspective, the same thing when you look at human skin books, people are immediately horrified because of this sacro sacrosanct idea of our, um, you know, our belief in bodily and medical consent, but that, that idea of even having recent. <laughs> it's so recent and it's been violated over and over again even after it existed but it's like a mid-20th century idea so you know those th that's kind of where I started but there was really just certain you know stories I wanted to tell anytime I could have know anything about a person that was actually made into a book I wanted to make sure I foregrounded the person as well and not just having part of the reason why I love the book so much is it's not it's not like I mean it's a book about books that are found in human skin it's not you know it's it's not like about sunshine and rainbows but you definitely do just a masterful job of being so respectful and centering the right things and making it about the people and it just I think it makes the book five thousand times better thank you thank you so much and like I actually while I was writing the book I read your first book um you know, the lady from the Black Lagoon. And I was like, oh, we're doing somewhat of a similar thing here because you take us on your research journey. Mm -hmm. And that was the thread that we had to decide and it took a long time and there was people who disagreed with me and I had to like, you know, wrestle for it a little bit. But in order to cover that much time and for the book to feel coherent, I, I felt like there had to be a through line and the through line was me like you coming on the journey with me and that's also the places where you can get a little humor because I am never going to make fun of someone who something like happened to like this but I can make fun of myself for ruining my shoes in the leather tan you know <laughs> yeah. so you need a little release valve sometimes yeah you're talking about really heavy things and I really tried to walk a line and luckily I feel like readers like walk the line with me you know but you you did that a lot too and I was kind of thinking about you know when you were when you were writing that book and taking people along research journey and like in the subsequent time of you hearing from readers and everything do you feel like folks really seem to enjoy that element because maybe they feel like they don't have access to physical research travel and things the way that you know they perceive writers to uh, well, I think it's that, but it also just makes it a little bit more compelling. It gives it a little bit more of a narrative. Um, for the reason I did it for, uh, brought people along on my journey in Lady from the Black Lagoon is because I knew that I had to give people a reason to care about Millicent because it's one thing when you're writing a biography of a well-known person, like people are just going to buy it, buy that book because they care about that person. When you're writing a book about someone that nobody knows about, you have to give them a reason to care and that quickest way I knew how to get people to care about Millicent was to show them how much I cared about her and show them how hard I was, uh, how hard I was at work finding her story. So I just sort of brought them along. Um, and I'm sure you've experienced the same thing. And we were talking, you were talking a little bit earlier about um, making nonfiction and history a little bit more accessible and bringing people along and, and taking the time to sort of make sure that you are explaining things and making sure everyone's on board. Uh, I know that's something that you and I both do and it's something that's important to both of us because uh, Girly Drinks is not a memoir uh, like Lady from the Black Lagoon is. It's just a history book, um, just a straight up history book, um, no pun intended. 
but I really, I, I wanted to write it in the same kind of style. Like I still make j- jokes. Um, I still swear. I still have silly footnotes. And I mean, you really hit on the thing when you said um, a, a, a release valve, because when you're talking about a lot of the things I talk about in, uh, in both Lady from the Black Lagoon and Girly Drinks, they make me mad. <laughs> Sexism is not a fun thing to write about. Um, I, unless you have a lot of bourbon, like, like I did, <laughs> but it, you know, I, I felt like there's a, in, in, just like in a lot of our daily lives that you, things that you and I experience, like if you don't cry about these things, you have to laugh. So it does feel very good to make fun of things, especially like, I mean, you said you, you shouldn't make fun of the people who are, who's, whose bodies are being turned into books, but you can make fun of the people who are terrible enough to do it to them without their consent. And it feels good to put that stuff in a context and to say, yeah, this is happening, but at the same, like there's no true history. All history is a story, you know? And I really wanted to make sure, and I know that you do too, to say, hey, this, these things are happening, but this guy's a garbage person or this person is a garbage person or whatever it is to be able to sort of put that into context and, and show how you feel. And um, I also ran up against a lot of opposition um, Luckily, I did girly drinks with the same editor that I did Lady from the Black Lagoon. And so I knew he was like on board for bad jokes and swearing. Um, but it took me, it took us a while to find an editor that was in for that. I had editors that were who really wanted to push the book into, and I know you had this problem too, push the book into a different direction, um, make it something that it really wasn't, make it more serious, make it a little less accessible, make it um just more scholarly and more academic. And that's just not what I like to do. I wanna bring as many people along as I can. I want, I'm passionate about the things that I write about and I want other people to be too. And writing like a thousand page tome that wasn't fun is, I don't think is the way to do that. Yeah, uh, one of the, one of your editorializing lines that I really, it like actually made me like laugh snort, which is a good thing. And when books can make you laugh snort, then, then that's great. Was um, when the reporters were hounding one of the uh, bootleggers and you're like, silly reporters, girls don't like boys, like uh, about their about their love life. Silly reporter, girls don't like boys. They like whiskey and money, I think it was, or booze and money. Yes, and, they did. Uh, well, so that made me laugh really hard. The thing that I was, that, one of the other reason why I wanted to make it a global history and um, I know that you saw the same thing too when you were writing dark archives is you start to pick up on patterns and I wanted to show people that this pattern of women being innovative in the kitchen where the power of the home resides um, and creating some sort of way of making alcohol or cocktail or whatever it was and then men taking it over as soon as it became commercially viable it I mean mid by midway through the book you can just like you can see what's going to happen. And um, same thing with the, so the, the the part that you're talking about is in the prohibition chapter, which is the meatiest chapter of the book. So much happened during that time period in the uh, 1920s and our very, very early 1930s. And the biggest uh, America in like North America, the biggest rum runner and uh, booze smuggler was a woman named Gertrude Lithgow. And her name, her nickname was Cleopatra. So people called her Cleo and she she worked out of the Bahamas and she was the big like she was a millionaire she made so much money because she smuggled real scotch real whiskey real rye real bourbon real gin into the country um one of the cool things uh that I found out for the book is that the phrase the real McCoy uh comes from a man named Bill McCoy who was a very famous famous bootlegger and he got that uh, reputation because the stuff that he sold wasn't bathtub gin like a lot of other people were selling. He was selling real scotch and real bourbon and real rye so people could trust them, trust him to give them the real McCoy. And the reason he got that reputation is because he got all of his stuff from Gertrude Lithgow. Um, so she's this like this woman carrying a pistol around, driving speedboats up into Florida with a big bunch of bourbon in the back. She's making all this money and reporters loved her, but of course, they didn't want to ask her about her, you know, multi-millionaire, multi-million dollar smuggling ring. They were like, are you single? Who are you? Are you married? Like, what kind of man do you like? And it just really blew my mind that literally a hundred years ago, which is bonkers to think of the 1920s as a hundred years ago, but here we go. The media was the same. 
it, like no different. And it really, uh, th these patterns of the way that women are talked about and the way that women are treated and the way that women are looked at, going back thousands of years, like Cleopatra, it, the same thing happened to Cleopatra. Like it just totally boggled my mind. Yeah, the, uh, you know, although it is a world history and I learned so much and there were so many things where I'm like, I want to know what chicha tastes like. I want to know how these, like, you know, different, really interesting world, uh, you know, alcoholic beverages taste like. Uh, I feel like there is definitely a market for let's, let's do some like traditional and historic like drinks at like there is a place where you go to have things from around the world in different time periods would be like such a cool oh I would uh, be there I would be the at that bar in a heartbeat yeah it would be so fun um but you know you do call cocktails like America's first real like art form so a lot of people think of jazz but cocktails came before jazz Cocktails came before jazz. They did. And also helped jazz. Um, and so, but also like one of the things that fascinated me about that Americanness and of the cocktail, you know, as an idea um, was also that like girly drinks weren't even girly and that, you know, men drank things that were people would call girly and that yes. even after prohibition the um the most popular drink in the 30s for women were old fashions which is a favorite of mine you know and I was like oh hey I'm, I'm right in line with this uh with those oh, yeah. 30s uh girls so that it gives you an opportunity this book gives you ample opportunities if you're a pedant like me for the well actually Oh, I mean, the goal for me for this book was just be one of those books that you read and you go to a party and you're like, hey, did you know? Because that, I mean, the entire time I, I was working on this book, I, I was texting my best friend whenever I would find some cool fact, which would be several times a day, I would be texting Lauren, who's the person the book is dedicated to. I'd be like, oh my God, did you know? Like, is that it is chock full of there's so many cool things. I mean, we're starting right from the beginning, the fact that straws were invented to drink beer with, like, there's just so many cool things. Yeah, I was reading in bed and leaning over to my husband like, in Scotland, Japan, and Canada, whiskey is spelled with just a Y, but in <laughs> Ireland, it's an E. <laughs> you know, there is a ton of that to be uh, smarty pants at cocktail parties. That was parties. fun during copy editing, let me tell you. <laughs> oh yeah, I bet. Whenever we, uh, we get be whenever we're able to do real cocktails together again that is uh yeah. we, have, you know, we have to swap some copy editing stories i hope people are starting to get together their questions i have a couple more before we you know switch to folks but I'm gonna uh, have to put my glass. so nadja obviously does not wear glasses i unfortunately do so i just i don't have contacts so i just i don't have my glasses on right now but i will be putting them on so i can see okay. people's questions. yeah i have a few more also i can read them out that's my hosting responsibilities if you like but um there are so many fun words and ideas in this book like the idea of the snug i was like can we start one Yes. So snugs were really, really cool. They were in, they were a British thing in the um, 1800s, I think. Um, you think I would know this, but there's a lot of information in this book. It's a British thing. I mean, it, it started really in the late 1700s, 1800s. And they, I mean, you would still find snugs today. And it was a, there was everywhere in an English tavern in later in English public houses and bars, it was all separated by class. So there were places where the, the tavern, which is where the lower class people drank, the lounge, which is where the upper class people drank, but there was a thing called a snug in a lot of taverns. And it was sort of a set off out of the way, no windows or closed windows and closed space where women drank because no one, they were separated. The big thing was like Victorians loved separation and organizing things into different categories. They were like, fucking JK Rowling, you know, they love organizing people into categories. And um, so they, they really wanted to separate, um, they, they didn't want the men to have to be subjected to the scandal of seeing women drink. And they didn't want women to have to see like the gross things that men drink, I get I mean, Apparently everyone drinks differently. Um, so a lot of women and um, also clergy people, you know, people 
cheating on their wives, politicians drank in the snug, which was like a very private and clo closed space to drink. Um, but it also sounds kind of cool. And now I'm like, I want a little enclosed drinking space. Yeah, I kind of do too. I mean, once it's like safe to be in a little space like that, I, I was wondering, I don't know if you've seen Peaky Blinders, but I'm kind of wondering. I haven't, but my boyfriend's a huge fan. Yeah, you should ask him if he thinks that the place where they have their little meetings in the bar that, that they run is a snug, because I feel like it might I be. actually will. Like a historical little, you know, there's a special window that goes through like right to the the room that's closed off oh, and, and that it, sounds it, like a snug interesting and there are some other like the uh kumamato moon viewing parties with women just like yes the day. moon viewing yeah. parties so this is something that happened moon. um in rural japan um in the 1920 up, up in like around the 1920s is that uh the women of the village would go out when during the full moon and bring candy and cake in booze and go get, I can't say what I want to say, really drunk together <laughs> uh, it, it, and have these moon viewing parties. And it was it, like the coolest, I, and I, I, that was another thing that I texted my best friend and I was like, do we need to have moon viewing parties? Cause this is the coolest thing ever. I, I think I think we need to, to do this. And then I know you are a tattoo enthusiast Another seemingly great idea is the Makushi women in the Amazon. <gasps> They're Florida. my favorite part of the whole book. And Megan, I love them. Can I tell the story? Of the and also tell me, I feel like you have a creature tattoo. I do. You have a Milson Patrick tattoo. Are you thinking about doing? Oh yes. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm getting. Okay, so folks. Oh my god, the coolest thing ever. This is maybe my favorite thing in the entire book, and that's saying a lot. So. Uh, this Amazonian tribe down in South America, they're called the Makushi people. And the women there, like in many cultures, are the people who completely control the brewing. And the brewing that they do is absolutely cool. Please buy the book and read about it because they do, they, they ferment with fungus, which is very unique in the entire, like not just the South America, but the entire world. But the other cool thing that they did up until the 1960s was that um, they had this practice of getting special charm tattoos, um, you know, to, to imbue them with some sort of like, oh, well, I'm, you know, for childcare or, or, or farming or whatever. Um, but there was a special type of fermentation charm that they would get. They would get these tattoos and depending on what kind of tattoo it was, it would either be, um, to make their drink stronger, to make the beer that they made, the cassava beer uh, that was made from the cassava root stronger or sweeter if they were making some sort of wine or a sweeter beer. Um, and the, the way that what the tattoos were is that they were bugs or in like some sort of art, um, insect or arthropod. So if they wanted um, their, uh, their beer to have an extra kick and be very high ABV and, and to, to be, they wanted to be imbued with the supernatural ability to make stronger beer, they would get a tattoo of a scorpion. But if they wanted their, their, their uh, fruit, their mango wine to be sweeter, they would get a tattoo of a bee. And I was like, this is the absolute coolest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. So I'm gonna be getting a scorpion tattooed on my hand. <laughs> yeah, I would have gone with the bee, but I'm real a big fan of bees. Um, but I I love it. I love it so much. Yeah, I got a book finishing tattoo as well. What did and, you get? Uh, I didn't know that. Oh, hold on, I gotta put my glasses on. Here, let's see. So this is a book plate oh, that I came across in my travels. So the um at, at the College of Physicians of Philadelphia, which is at the Mitter Museum. It says Cassasia in French, which means what do I know? It's a Montaigne quote. And there's a book and a skull and a butterfly on top. So I actually thought it was a moth, but I, then I, I came to discover it has a proboscis and that is, means it's a butterfly. So uh, I'm going to spit my friends out. A, a very quick. Uh, oh my God. It's so nice to have my glasses and my things out. Blech. Okay, here we go. Sorry. I'm no, I'm only partially nausea now. It's um, um, Mallory again. So a fun, so for anyone who has or will buy the book before in any format of my book for before the 15th, I had this um, artist make a like <gasps> art piece of my book that is made out of the book. Also, Megan, can you please tell them about the amazing books that they made? Oh, yeah. I, I'll drop a I link in the chat. I lost my mind over those. So I'm giving this away on my website 
uh, or if you find me on social media, I'm at library at night. I'm going to give this away. If you show me that you bought it at some point, I just thought it would be cool. I got myself one too, but I just thought it was like super fun. That's what uh, I did with the koozies. I just wanted them for myself. And I was like, mm, maybe I should also do a giveaway. <laughs> I'll get two and one is for me. And then one can be for someone else. And then I feel justified in like doing it. But anyway, I, I also wanted to, I didn't want something that just said dark archives. I mean, like why I don't really feel like people, it's not like a band shirt that people might like want. I mean, but I would I think this totally is, wear a dark archive shirt. I think this is a really cool piece of like little like memento mori art. And it is extremely cool women woman artists paper quiller they're called um and so yeah i will find and drop um oh wait know. alex just said i'm looking finally looking at the chat now that i have my glasses on and i'm allowed to swear yes oh this event just got oh and lauren's here too okay so there's the giveaway entry form and then what mallory was talking about was i had this like super amazing honor in that um six of the best um art binders in the world probably uh came together to uh bind like they used my book as inspiration and used the text block to make bespoke bindings of my book which is like for a book nerd you just like lose your mind and we're selling them um to benefit a uh to fund a BIPOC focused scholarship program at the Guild of Book Workers hell yeah and it's like, I don't know if I can share a screen like super quickly, but there was one that I feel like is really everyone, please, as soon as this event is over, go to Megan's Instagram and look at them. They are incredible. Here, I'll show you real quick, just like real quick while everyone's getting their questions up. So this one, woman binder. And so what she did, I'm a big fiber arts person. I knit my own hat and everything. She did embroidery on this. And if you can see, these are the names. Mary Lynch is uh, one of the women who is bound into three books in my book. And then she also put the names of various other women who were, you know, uh, abused in the um, in the medical, uh, like by doctors. And so you can see there's like, there's fungus and then the there's a dead man's finger fungus which look like corpse hands and you can see all their names like Henrietta Lacks and and a number of other like women's names like the women um uh who were abused by um Sims for instance uh the gynecologist so uh the enslaved women so this binding is like first of all it's beautiful and secondly it's like really moving and amazing and so to have these artists like use my work as inspiration for something like that is just like I couldn't have the coolest. imagined in a million years and I think it's amazing and especially because then we're able to like you know this art this art form is not a well-known like art form today it's not something people really think of so being able to help uh, BIPOC folk who are interested in creating this kind of art to like learn the craft is is really cool. So um, yeah, there are so many. And when you click through the pictures and then click on the name, you get their artist statements and stuff like that, which are really cool too. So, so freaking cool. So shall we move to questions? Yeah, let's do some questions. All right, I can like read them too, if you like. Yeah, uh, yeah, you, you, you pick the ones and uh, I, I, I took a peek through them and I think some of them can be for both of us, so. Okay, let's start with this one from Shannon. Of all the different alcoholic beverages from around the world that you learned about, is there any drink you want to go travel and try firsthand? <sighs> yes, even though some of them are a little gross. Um, because I, I ended up track being able to track down a lot of um, a lot of the beers that I and uh, and wines and things that I wanted to try um, before. I, obviously, I started this book pre pandemic and I had wanted to travel to Japan, South Africa, um, Scotland, Ireland. There were a lot of places that I really wanted to go. Obviously, that didn't work out so well for me. Um, but I think uh, the thing that I most want to try um, 
or, or different types of beers. Um, there is a type of corn beer that is made in South America called chicha. And it was originally made by Chew. And th this is actually, it's not unique to South America. This was something that was pretty common um, before uh, like very, very early days in, in civilization, people would ferment things by chewing them. Like sake originally had the consistency of oatmeal. It was literally just chewed up rice and you would spit it in a bowl, wait for it to ferment and you'd eat it with chopsticks. Yeah, um, but ch I've never had corn beer and chicha, there are people still in the world who make chicha the old, old way with their mouths, uh, but I, I have not been able to get a hold of any uh, corn beer because uh, a lot of people just make corn beer now just with no, no spit involved, <laughs> just they, uh, just a regular way to make beer. And I really, really want, wanted to try it. And it's something I haven't been able to track down. Um, and I would love, and I, but the thing is, I know that women still make a lot of um, chicha and corn beer in, uh, in Peru today. I really wanted to go and talk to them and try some and, and um, yeah, maybe someday. Yeah, I want to try chicha, but I also, yeah, you know, now that we're all complete germaphobes for good reason, that um, the chewing thing is a little much, but I have had lagers and things I'm, that I'm like, corn pop. I taste, it's like, tastes corn yeah. pop. You know, yeah, that I've never tried corn a corn beer. And I'm so desperate. Although I will say, I'm trying, I'm going to have a little bit of this bourbon in my special custom girly drink glass that my best friend made for me. Unfortunately, these are not for sale, but they are cool. Cool. Yeah, definitely cool. And uh, I think the one, there were so many that I was just like, I, I was going to say, what, what about you? I, I feel like we should, well, first of all, since you wanted to go to Ireland and Scotland and didn't get to, that is also like the number one thing on my list for post-pandemic travel is going to Dublin and going to uh, Edinburgh. Because when I did my European research for the book, I was mostly in England and went all over England. And then I went to France and then like Edinburgh I was going to like pop back and pop up to Edinburgh which is not like easy to do but I was going to do it because Edinburgh is like the source of a whole chapter of my book it was also the seat of clinical medicine at the time this was happening and and just the descriptions of even from trial transcripts from Burke and Hare of the wines and closes the little like you know alleys that that they would be uh, that Burke and Hare, who actually murdered people to uh, not to make skin books, but Burke was made into a skin book later. Which is pretty cool. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> uh, there's a lot, there's a lot there because it's like, how do you feel about state, like, incarceral, <laughs> you know, punishment? And there's a lot. Um, but there, he was also objectively <laughs> like a monster. Yeah. Um, and they were taking, they were killing people, marginalized people, including people with like intellectual disabilities and stuff and smothering them, which is called burking and putting them in a tea trunk and then dragging the tea trunk to Surgeon Square where the surgeons were like, oh yeah, this is normal. This is normal for poor people to do that they don't really care about their dead. Poor people are a different species, it's fine. Yeah, they don't care about their dead family members. They just, you know, Poor people don't have feelings. What do pristine you mean? looking bodies to then to go dissect. Like, here's your money. Thank you very much. Here's more money than you would ever make in like 20 years for one body, like digging ditches and, and go have fun. So I just like want to be there and want to walk through the streets, which is yeah. and stuff. So I'm just saying road trip. I, like when it's like we should do that well we need to have drinks anyway because that's the first place that jeremy and i want to go is ireland um, because i want to go for bloomsday i want to i want to do like the james joyce like walking tour and stuff oh like yeah that. well my best friend and i really want to go do a distillery tour i also want to do that and yeah maybe we go to isla maybe we do it maybe we make it a whole thing this sounds like an excellent plan which to Bessie favorite. Williamson, my favorite woman in the book yes and Bessie Williamson vibes is, uh, you know, you say there's this new trope of like the cool girl who drinks whiskey and stuff. And it's we like, need to bring it back, Megan. We need yeah, to bring it back really to the OG the whiskey girl. girl, frumpy sweaters, cat's eye glasses, comfortable wool. 
Listen, I'm a knitter. I got the glasses. I'm frumpy as heck. I am good to go. Let's do this. I'm bringing yeah. it. I'm bringing Bessie, Bessie uh, Williamson back. Oh, and yeah. I love a PD. I love a PD uh, scotch. So I feel like I feel like we're ready. Anyway, there. But I think the one drink that was totally outside of that <laughs> um, was. I, I was like, this will either be delicious or disgusting is the drink that is, I want to say it was like sake and horchata had a baby. <gasps> Makoli, yes. You can buy that here. You can buy it in America. So oh. it became one of my favorite things um, uh, that, and I buy regularly. Actually, my best friend got me it as a girly drinks release present. There's an amazing brewery. It's called Makoli, M-A-K-G-E-O-L-L-I. And it is a fermented Korean beverage. It is sort of like sake on orchata had a baby. And uh, there's an amazing brew, like female uh, created brewery in Red Hook in Brooklyn called Hana, H-A-N-A. And it, I, I didn't realize, like I had been trying to find it. And um, luckily my best friend was like, just go to get Uber Eats from a Korean restaurant. I was like, holy crap. Or wait, Alex said I can swear. Holy shit. And it is delicious. I absolutely love it. It really is. It's very thick. It's milky. Um, but it, it tastes, I just, I love it. It's like, a, it's not too heavy. It's about the same ABV as wine. And it is, it's just very like creamy, but also light. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. And Korean women made it. Korean women were really responsible for all of the innovations and in making makgeolli. And it, uh, uh, even when Japan started colonizing that country, uh, this was another really cool pattern that I saw in girly drinks is that women and women making booze were really at the heart of every rebellion uh, in uh, in any colonized country, uh, whether it was Japan or Africa or, or Mexico, wherever it was in the world. And that's how they would, they would, Korean women would bribe the Japanese police with their makoli to, uh, because one of the patterns that happened is that colonized countries would come in and be like, wow, booze is the way to control people. We're going to push all of their booze out and make it so they can only make booze in factories and take it away from women. But in Korean women were like, wow, fuck that forever and kept making it in their kitchens. And when they would get caught, they would just bribe the police officers with their makgeolli and uh, they would let them go because it was amazing and delicious. And it's just like so, so, so cool. There's so many great questions in here. I'm just gonna like kind of roll the dice here. Oh yeah, we're, get, we're getting towards the end. I wanna say folks, yes, both girly drinks and dark archives are super cool and awesome. Especially right now, it's almost Halloween. You know you want a book about books bound in human skin, but get it through this link. You can get them both signed. I, again, we're in the pandemic. Megan and I do not do a lot of in-person events. Megan's having her first one in LA uh, next weekend, which is really, really exciting. But it's signed books are hard to come by in the pandemic. So if you want them, get them from here. Support StoryFest, support the Westport Library. We love them. Um, yes. All right. More questions. Yes. And just in case there are, there are anyone, there are people that are um, in either LA or uh, in the um I, don't know, I just realized i wasn't writing to the whole chat here you go uh if there's anyone who's in la or in philadelphia um i am doing two in-person events the la one is on the 6th and the philly one is at the Muta museum on the 13th if you're on the east coast and you're a big book nerd this is the one to go to because not only will we have the largest collection of confirmed human skin books in the world on display to see, which is not usually the case. We will also have all those bindings on display for the only time. So okay, like, cool. please come and let me look like a big shot in my hometown because I'm a little worried that people aren't gonna go because so please go. It's gonna be amazing. Um, so questions, um, there's so many good ones. It's really hard. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask John's question and then also answer a little bit of it from my book and then go to you. So John says, can we now expect a book on the world history of women and tattoos in movie uh, question mark in movies question mark with monsters and booze question mark. So I did want to also mention that tattoos are covered in my book because 
Um, I tried to talk about towards the end of the book, what would it be like in the age of consent? Like, what would it be like to try to make a human skin book? Is that legal? Is everyone's like, oh, that must be illegal, right? And the answer is that's complicated and depends Megan, on- Megan, I will tell you right now, you can have my skin if you want. If, you, if I die before you, you can have my skin. This is being recorded. I know. You know my, um, I, Mallory O'Mara, would swear that Megan Rosenblum could have my skin when I die. My, uh, the director at the Muter Museum, who's a great friend of mine and also, you know, part of the Anthropodermic Book Project, uh, she, when she saw my tattoo, because I, I failed to mention this is also the logo of the library at the Muter Museum, uh, she was like, well, that's jar worthy. Like, she's like, when you're ready, you can give it to me. And I'm like, you know, this is not that bad of an idea, but also like, we need to wait for express consent from me. I need to think it over. I need to talk to people. It would be extremely cool. Like that is the next level author shit is being your own book. Right. So imagine like walking and that's actually what, uh, there's a whole chapter uh, about a guy named George Walton. He had many aliases, the best of which is Burley Grove. So that is a porn star name for certain (laughs) he was a highway robber in in 19th century uh boston actually not too far from from westport boston area and um he is one of the few people that we know of that expressly wanted his body made into books and did it and his book is at the Boston Athenaeum. And the best part is that his, it binds the narrative like he, that he dictated himself to the warden while he was dying of tuberculosis in Massachusetts State General Prison. So we actually know a whole lot about his life and the way that he looked at things and stuff. So yeah, that just kind of makes me think of him. But um, yeah, the tattoo, uh, the tattoo thing, so there are people out there right now um, who different outfits that exist that are trying to allow people to or facilitate them uh, preserving tattoos, right? So before you either had to dry them, like so doctors used to do this, they would fi- they would be dissecting a person like, you know, often marginalized people in some regard, like, oh, it's a sailor or it's a whatever, you know, people, because tattooing was like really unusual. If they came across a tattoo, they'd be like, oh, cool. I'll take this off and save it for later. Like, just because it's cool and weird and the rest of the body is going in the trash. And so they would either dry it, which is gross in its own way. And I have a run in with one of those in, in the book unexpectedly, but, or also do a wet specimen, right? But now there's this like other method. That's my porno name. Yeah, <laughs> wet specimen. <laughs> there, there's this other method now that's new and like secret proprietary thing where you can um, preserve the skin and it looks like really bright and fresh even if you're old and your tattoo is old it, it, it like goes down a couple of levels so it's like really bright and fresh and you can have it dry and nicely framed and this is like a way to remember people and one of the interesting things about it in the age of I want this done to my body no one would do that to you if you didn't want it right that would be like highly illegal um and unethical is that a lot of tattoo people are like yeah sign me up I'm totally cool with that like they're not grossed out by the idea but whether it's actually like fully legal that basically what you do desecration of a corpse the idea of it it's like based on community standards and it's complaint based. So if someone's going to complain that you did that, then maybe there would be a lawsuit and things that happen. But if not, uh, you know, it's sort of like people just kind of do what they want and and see what happens. So it's kind of crazy. Anyway, two things. So. One, Megan, have you ever seen the film Final Member? No. I'm going to DM you about that later. It's about the Icelandic Penis Museum in the in the. Uh, uh, legal subtleties of trying to donate your penis to a museum. Second thing, um, yes to more women's history. Um, the I have 
pitched my next book, which is another feminist deep dive into something that I'm very interested in. Basically, my entire career has just gone, hey, I'm interested in this thing. I'm going to start reading about it. Oh, crap. There's no women's history. That's annoying. Guess I better do it myself. So the next thing I want to write is another feminist deep dive. It is not into tattoos, but it, that is something that I would really, really like to do. In the meantime, you can read a great book by um, Margot Mifflin. It's called uh, Bodies of Subversion. That is a history of women in tattoos. It's really, really cool. Um, but yes, you can keep an eye out. Hopefully, I on submission right now cross all your fingers and toes that the editor i pitched it to wants it i have another feminist world history deep dive into a subject that i'm very much interested in and very stunned to discover that there are no women's history books and actually not really really no history books at all written about the subject so how much time do we have left are we like just gonna say we have a lot more questions yeah we do um so I see that uh, Kelly asks, for those of us who like to read fiction and nonfiction at the same time, any recs on a novel or short story to pair with girly drinks? Uh, it, you know, Alex put in the chat about a Shirley Jackson panel coming up. Um, the Lottery and other stories would be a great uh, companion because uh, Shirley liked to drink. I picked up this book when I, uh, the first time I went to New Orleans with my best friend um this would be pretty fun it takes place in Storyville in New Orleans which was like a very uh no pun intended storied uh neighborhood which sort of anything went during prohibition um I haven't read it yet um but this would probably be a good one to read with this is a novel fiction uh read with girly drinks there you go and um maybe last one uh are there other spooky or Halloween related booze facts you picked up during your research and or what are your respective picks for quintessential Halloween drinks? Oh, well, you're, I mean, your book is very spooky. I'm trying to, Megan, what do you think? What is this? What do you think is the spookiest thing in girly drinks? Hmm. The patriarchy. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, spookiest thing in girly drinks girly drinks is very unlike me it's not very spooky um i'm trying to think of something i mean else. it's it's gonna be ale um in the witches uh the ale wives which is chapter three i mean the, the ale wives really took up a really long period of time so they're split up into three chapters um because the girly drinks starts chronologically it goes from the beginning of civilization until now um and uh it goes from the hildegard's chapter in the early middle ages um high middle ages and then uh the renaissance a little bit in chapter five um so probably the witches and if you want to be like a witchy alewife the thing to drink is ale so any kind of an ale uh you know even an ipa white ale pale ale um would be a uh, appropriately witchy and spooky to go I, I i remembered it i remembered the spooky thing that i loved again with the awesome names this is like my black metal album name the drunkenness of hathor yes. yeah so ancient uh goddess was going to destroy all of humanity but the sun god ra distracted her by filling the fields with red beer to look like a delicious pool of blood. And then she drank so much that she forgot to destroy mankind. <laughs> so red right. ale, let's it's do so, red ale. It's so relatable, you know? Yeah, it's it's like, who, who amongst us has not? And um, I think that, yeah, there are a lot of spooky names for red ales that are out there too. Like, there, uh, yeah, there is, I believe there are a few ales called, uh, named after Hathor, there are a few named after Ninkasi. None, interestingly enough, are created by women, uh, so there is another, something that, there's a hole in the market for that, but yeah, there's, a, in the beginning part of the book, in the ancient world part, there is a lot of really cool talk about, um, I tried to focus the um, the book as much as I could in, in like, facts, and like, real women, but I couldn't ignore um some of the ancient goddesses that were all about alcohol and there's some pretty cool stuff in there yeah they um i want to say there was a beer called like night of the living red there's a bunch of red like related 
spooky Halloween beers. There's so many Halloween beers right now, uh, which is great. And the pumpkin and beer, I have been drinking. The pumpkin beer market has really exploded to a lot. Of Although I will say the best best pumpkin beer is still Shipyard Pumpkinhead from New England, or excuse me, Shipyard uh, Pumpkinhead from New England. Still the very very best, but there are still a lot of other good ones out there. Yeah, I agree. Uh, but I've had ones that are like now it's like pumpkin porter, pumpkin like stout, pumpkin whatever, which is like cool. I uh, I'm not usually a sweet drinker, but I love the like autumn pumpkin beers, and then I drink enough by like mid October to not want any again for like a really long time. But yeah, that's that's what our job is this month. Yeah, we gotta hold the spooky drinks, spooky girly drinks. That's yeah. That's the spookiest girly drink right now is the pumpkin beer, maybe. Oh, for sure. For sure. All right. Do we want to do what? I have no idea how we're doing on time. Um, I don't know either. How, how, how many, how, like, do we have time for one more? Because there's, there's, there's one that I really. Uh, one more. That is yes. pretty cool. Uh, from Amelia, who says, how did you make, and this is something for both of us, uh, which I think is really, really fun. Uh, one of the reasons I was really excited to talk to Megan is because I don't have a lot of nonfiction author friends, and, and uh, so I got really excited when Megan and I became friends. Um, so Amelia says, how did you make scope decisions in order to represent the world history aspect while keeping a clear and narrative reasonable book length? Um, Megan, you want to go first and swift? Yeah, it was really hard because, um, yeah, you know, it was, uh, I really, things got cut out of the book, things didn't, you know, maybe there wasn't enough on a certain thing, but um, I, I just really tried to make sure that each chapter kind of somehow, that there was some way that I could have a line or two, and I noticed this in Girly Drinks too, where you could connect one chapter to the next, right? that sort of Victorian, almost like cliffhangery, like little did they know that this thing was Little happen. did they know, yeah. I love yeah, that. so I did try to like make that happen. But some, you know, I, I've gotten like, it's been really nice how positive the response has been to Dark Archives. And some of the only things that some folks have said were things like, oh, at the end when she gets into all the legal stuff, like I was saying of how you, how you would do it today, that some people weren't like that into that. But I, I, that was the oh, stuff I, I was into that. Geeked out on, right? Because, you know, yes, you Give could talk about I want to know. Past, but what, it, what does that mean today? And the, the today answer is not, oh, you could never ever do that today. And these are the reasons why. It's more like, people actually kind of want to do stuff like this and they don't, and the law has not caught up with that. So it's kind of interesting, but it, it, it is hard to, to find the right book sized idea. And that's something I'm thinking a lot about whether whenever I go for book two or not is like, what is narrow enough to be a book and wide enough to have a lot of meat to like really get a good, narrative arc it's it's a tough balance yeah I mean as, as uh, it, it's funny calling my I am a historian but it feels weird taking on that that title but as as a feminist historian um you know I it'd be very easy to think of me as like the selfless person who goes on this crusade and really like every single project that I write is to satisfy my own personal curiosity. So when it, I mean, girly drinks could have very, very easily been a thousand pages long and it might've gotten pretty boring. I mean, I, I know you feel the same way about dark archives is there's so many little, um, there's just so much stuff and so many cool things you're talking about. And there's so many little tangents that you can go down on for pages and pages and pages. Um, but I found that keeping, um, keeping my mission statement and thinking constantly about the lens through which I was looking at the subject, which was women's history, you know, and wonder, wondering like how things got gendered, what women were drinking at this certain period of time, how it was connected to other women's history at the time. That was my, the lens, which I looked at girly drinks. And that was, that. that's what kept me from going too far off the rails in any direction. Because even if I, I mean, 
again, the prohibition chapter is probably the thickest chapter in the book because there's just so much going on. Uh, but even then, I wanted to keep it moving because there are so many other women to talk about and so many cool stories. And I wanted to show how it was all connected. And uh, I also wanted to get to the other things that interested me. So, um, so much of it just stems from my own personal curiosity. And um, the, the best advice that I can ever give to a nonfiction author is write as if you are telling a story at a party to somebody about someone that they don't know. You give them just enough backstory so that they care and that they are invested in the story and that they understand what's going on, but you don't give them enough backstory to bore them. That is the perfect balance to keep. And honestly, if you are worried about it and wondering, test it out. Talk to people in your life, tell these stories, see how they feel uh, as, as you are speaking them, and then you will start to be able to grasp the, the scope that you need to have and the shape that the story needs to have. Honestly, I, I, like we're, you know, Megan, we're authors, we are hermits, we would rather live in a, the hole of a tree and never speak to anybody and hide and how, you know, I get that. But at the same time, I can't overestimate, I, I can't overstate how important it is to even just talk to other authors to have a, a network in your life of people that you can talk to and discuss this with. Um, as I was writing Girly Drinks, I was constantly talking about it with my, my boyfriend who um, has heard every single fact at, in Girly early drinks discussed ad nauseum over dinner, my best friend, talking about things and discussing it with peers and colleagues and other writers and friends really is, I, I can't overstate how beneficial it is to be able to sort of filter out what is needed and what isn't, what is interesting and what isn't. And um, yeah, it just, I, I, that's the best, uh, I just talked about it. I would also say that uh, along those lines, another really good bit of advice I would give is uh, this comes from my days working at NPR, is that anything I write, I read out loud after I'm writing. And, you know, if you are stumbling over your words, there is probably a better way to write it that, and then it has it, a rhythm and a musicality to it and stuff um, that, that can really help, which also makes me think, I think we, at, at the bar, <laughs> we the uh, other night. Um, we were talking about writing music, like maybe. Oh yes, there. If you go on my website malloryomero.com, there is an official girly drinks playlist uh, that you can listen to while uh, that I listen to probably a million times while I uh, while I wrote this book that you can check out because uh, there's a lot of music that's mentioned in the book, stuff by Lucia Reyes, Bessie Smith, um, really influential songs by women about drinking. Um, that I really recommend you listen to. And that's, um, I was gonna ask, oh, gosh, I wish this event was like five hours long because I wanna know what you listened to during dark, when you wrote Dark Archives. Yeah, I have a uh, playlist as well. I have two. One is a sort of cheeky one that has to do with themes in the book that are just sort of like things yeah. like, yeah, talking about like, you know, um, both Run DMC and Willie Nelson have a song called Tougher Than Leather, for instance, just like really weird stuff like that. Um, and so there, there is one, so the cheeky playlist, I'll, hold on, let me see if I, I will copy it um, into the chat, but um, here we go. So here's the cheeky one, which I don't share that often because I don't want people to think I'm a jerk, but my, the Judas Priest hellbent for leather is like, hell yeah, fun one to start with. Um, but the one that I listened to while I was writing, because it's less like, you know, thinking about, um, it, it's less lyric intensive and less, you know, specific is, I just called it the library night. And it's just a lot of, I was trying to go for a mood or an energy and I wanted, I needed, especially because I was writing this book mostly when I had like a, a infant and then during pandemic and all this, I was like, so, well, I, I guess I wasn't writing it during pandemic, but, you know, um, I needed to be able to get into a certain vibe or energy, like, really quickly. And so one of the things I realized with, is that there was this one song called The Rider Song that's Nick Cave and Warren Ellis. Uh, they do soundtracks, and this was for the proposition. Not the bad Warren Ellis, the good Warren Ellis. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that, that was also confusing for me, too. But I was like, wait. 
Warren Ellis is on my publisher, is on my publisher, like Nick Cave's Warren Ellis? It's like, oh no, it's a different one. Um, but there's a song called The Writer Song. And actually the guy was talking about George Walton. It makes me think of him, right? Like of this like sort of lone highwayman kind of vibe. And so every time I sat down to write, you know, I would put it on um, shuffle it's after it, but it's always Pavlovian shit. Yeah, I would listen to that song first. And then I thought about it sort of like a David Lynch, like dropping in, like, okay, I'm dropping into writer mode. And this is how I get there. It's like, Don't even get me talking about David Lynch. We're going to be here for another two hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm just like a huge David Lynch fan. And I don't know how to do transcendental meditation, but I did. Can somebody please hire Megan and I to do a book or do a talk about how David Lynch influences our nonfiction writing, because I have a whole essay about it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a whole thing. And, um, and also, uh, have you seen um, Brand New Cherry Flavor? Because it's kind no, of- No, I haven't. I've heard it's wicked, wicked good. It's, it's one, like- Actually, one of my favorite David Lynch, uh, Alex Levine is here in this chat right now. And she's one of my favorite David, like anytime she does an uh, uh, essay about David Lynch, I read it and I will pitch, Alex, I will pitch this to you because I have my- a whole thing about da- the way that David Lynch thinks how helpful that is as nonfiction writers, if that makes sense. Yeah, my, my, because he's all about like learning how to access your creativity and stuff. And, um, but I would just say about brand new cherry flavor, it's super weird, but it, it, and not, but, and it is basically like, what if David Lynch was a woman and a feminist? That is what this. I've heard wicked good things. It, it is really wild stuff and and pretty interesting anyway so yeah like music can be super it, it can be really hard to find like the good stuff to write to but if you find that one song that has an energy of what you're trying to get to in the book and it might not make perfect sense to other people but it makes sense to you that thing like just when you sit down you start listening to that it can help you like the yeah, that pavlovian like get into the writer zone because that can be really hard so we should talk about a david lynch program after this so i have a whole again i have a whole essay about how david lynch is somehow my biggest inspiration as a non as a historian as a non-fiction writer i have a whole thing about it um somebody please let me do let me and megan talk about it all right well, you the, said the it place i'm doing of- my event in la uh in los Feliz, the philosophical research society it has this like really awesome occult book library and they have a picture of laura palmer in the fucking gift shop and one of the people who at least in the before times used to go to like every event there is the actor who plays the giant and i keep being like because 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 i saw him at a different thing there and i chickened out and didn't like tell him how much i i love him and then this time i would do it (laughs) All right. Well, you said it out loud in front of me and Cody, so we could we let's see. If Please we can make, make this that happen. happen. I have been dying to talk about that. Actually, also let me loop Alex Levine in. She's in the chat. She's one of my favorite short story writers. She's amazing. Um, please, can we do an event about writing and David Lynch? I would die. Well, thank you both so much. This was so much fun. This was awesome. Congrats on your books. Before we say goodnight, I just did a total link dump in the chat. The first one is to go buy these two awesome books, please. Uh, they are book plate signed. Just click that link. And then there's the rest of the story fest uh, this year, including a Shirley Jackson panel. It's Ellen Datlow moderating um, writers from her short story collection. When things get dark, that's tomorrow at one. That's all virtual tomorrow night at seven Eastern Stephen Graham Jones and Grady Hendricks are going to do some cool shit. We're not oh, quite story sure what. Fest is always stacked stacked this event tomorrow night we're not quite we have an idea of what they're doing they're still making it up as they go it's going to be awesome though it is both in person at the westport library and it's live stream so please check that out and then mitch album is is finishing things off on tuesday um but again by the books thank you both mallory and megan this was so much fun this was so great and this is our official invite to both of you to come to story fest in in person i will be there 
for sure. It's one of my favorite events. Thank you all for watching. Please check out Girly Drinks. Uh, I, I saw someone who was like, is there footnotes in the, in the audiobook? Yes. But if you want it in print, get it from StoryFest, get Dark Archives, check out the other events. Seriously, one of my favorite events of the year. Best thing I've ever done. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you, Alex. Both. Thank you, Thank Cody. you, everybody who's Thanks. watching. And happy Story Fest. And happy Halloween. Happy Here's Halloween. to Girly Drinks. All oh. those who drink them and make yeah. them. Everyone. Hell yeah. Night.